This is an interview for the Purdue University's Oral History Program. Today's date is November 29th, 2012. I'm here in Greenville, South Carolina, interviewing Mr. Chesterfield Jaynes, a member of Purdue's class of 1957. The interviewer is Tracy Grimm, Baron Hilton Archivist for Flight and Space Exploration at Purdue University Libraries. Mr. James, thank you very much for taking the time and agreeing to be interviewed for our program. My pleasure. And I'm going to ask you for our cataloging records to please state your full name and date of birth. Chesterfield Howell Janes, Jr., November 16th, 1934. Thank you. Um, and again, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of our program for the interviews. I'd like to start by asking you a questions, questions about um, your early years and your education. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up and where you grew up? Uh, I was born in Gainesville, Florida. My father at that time was a, an instructor and then a professor at the University of Florida teaching uh, mechanical drawing and ME shops. Uh, he was one of the three instructors in the United States that had a college degree that were teaching those courses. And in, as such, he made who's who in American universities at that time. I was a, a rather sickly child. I had a, a bad asthma problems. Uh, and we used kerosene heat in those days for heat and hot water. I was allergic, it turned out I was allergic to that. It bothered me very badly. So my father ended up getting into the propane gas business. And he migrated from, from the university into that. Uh, he was uh, very active as an instructor. He did drafting work on the side, which was a no-no in those days. Uh, he, we had a drafting table in the back bedroom in our house. And he used to go in and do drafting work at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning because in the 30s, they didn't have air conditioning. And in Florida. <laughs> in Florida. And uh, we lived in Gainesville until 1946. My parents were divorced in 1946. And I moved with my mother and brother and sister to a small town called Melrose, about 20 miles away. I had gone to a private school that was affiliated with the University of Florida called P.K. Young up through my first, f halfway through the fifth grade. Uh, and it was a, a little bit of a shock because when we moved to the town, the school had burned down. So the school was dispersed all over the community. And I went to, went to fifth and sixth grade in the, in the local women's club building. Uh, and uh, I, I finished my high school at Melrose. It was a uh, we were the smallest high school in the county. We were way off in one end of the county. So uh, we didn't have a lot of support from the county, I don't think. I uh, couldn't get a lot of the courses that I wanted. I want, was gonna, I knew I wanted to be an engineer. And uh, so uh, I, I took some correspondence courses in the University of Florida to get some of my mathematics. And even then, I, when I enrolled at Purdue, I was deficient in geometry, so I had to take a geometry course for no credit my freshman year. Uh, I was in class 37 hours a week oh my, gosh. my freshman year. I remember that very distinctly. <laughs> and I, I graduated number one in my class in high school. Uh, I had a, I briefly considered going to the University of Florida, but having been my father had been on the faculty there for a number of years. Uh, all our family friends were basically university people. Uh, I knew personally several deans, okay, and I could have walked into the president's office and he would call me by my first name. I used to sell, I picked blackberries when I was a little kid and I used to go around the neighborhood and sell pints of blackberries and I can remember selling them to his wife, okay. <laughs> so I didn't want to go to school there, so I went up to look at Georgia Tech. Uh, the family had a very strong connection to Georgia Tech. The, the president of Georgia Tech was the dean of engineering at Florida that hired my father. He went from there to, to the University of North Carolina and then to Georgia Tech. I went up to Georgia Tech. Uh, 
looked at the campus, got a tour of the campus in the presidential limousine, uh, and uh, decided I didn't want to go to school there because I thought it was in the middle of the city. It really wasn't, it certainly is now. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a portrait, oil portrait of my mother that was done by the dean's wife, okay, the president's wife, uh, that I have in my apartment right now. Okay, and it, that was been done in the summer of 1934. I always call a picture of my mother and me because she was pregnant with me at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Dr. Van Leer happened to be a, a Purdue grad. I was going to ask you what yeah. on earth. So. And I talked to a couple of, couple of people at the University of Florida who were Purdue grads. So I applied to Purdue and I got accepted, and which is really, in retrospect, I think fairly unusual. It would be very unusual today uh, because it was probably in uh, March or April of my senior year in high school when I applied. I got accepted uh, and uh, my father wrote a letter to the school about the parents being divorced and so Purdue gave me a uh, special merit scholarship that took care of my out-of-state tuition. Oh, good. So I, I went off to Purdue sight unseen. My parents never saw it until the week I graduated. Uh, I can remember I, I was at, went to a, a, what was a fairly new dorm at the time. It was called X Dorm, which is now women's dorm. And on one visit when my wife and I went there, we went up to my old room. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a uh, the uh, I was asleep on the bed because I'd flown up at night to Ch from Jacksonville to Chicago, and in Chicago picked up a wonderful little airline called Lake Central Airlines that flew from uh, Ch Chicago Midway to South Bend and then to Lafayette. Oh, so you flew into the so, Purdue uh, to the airport. So, so I went through, flew into Purdue Airport, and I I. Uh, got to the residence hall. Of course, it was on a Sunday, I think. They didn't have any meals there that day, so we had to worry about meals. But I, since I was the first one in the room, I took the lower bunk, okay? I was sound asleep when my new roommate came in, and his roommate happened to be Porter Bridwell, who was from Terre Haute, Indiana, and he discovered that we, would, we were both going to be aeronautical engineers, and we ended up being fraternity brothers. And I happened to see Porter two years ago in Huntsville, Alabama. Mm -hmm. I have a picture of he and I together. In fact, Rita has that picture. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I, I went to uh, with went to Purdue. Uh, I took what, well, in retrospect, was probably the wrong wrong course for me. I took the theoretical option. Okay, there was only four of us in that option. And if you look in the aerospace history of aerospace at Purdue, they said it was highly selected students that they had to get into this option. I don't know if I was highly selected or not, but I got in the option anyway. Uh, and it was, uh, I probably graduated with, uh, I'm gonna guess about 30, 30 to 35 credit hours at 500 level credit hours, okay, as an undergraduate. Wow, those are almost graduate courses. <laughs> yeah, they're grad, grad, <laughs> mid-level mid grad courses yeah. nowadays, so, uh, and were then too. I can remember, uh, one of the classes was taught by the head of the aero school. Okay, there was only four of us in the class. And I got introduced to oral exams then. He gave us an oral exam at the end of the class wow. as an undergrad. And who was that? Dr. Harold DeGroff. Mm -hmm. And uh, four years la later, I got my degree in June of 1957. Mm -hmm. um, having a roommate, Porter, it must have helped you a little bit with your transition from Florida <laughs> into the unknown of the Midwest and... Well, it, it did. I went down to uh, uh, Porter's house for Thanksgiving oh, in Terre Haute, okay? Porter was an only child. Uh, his father was a, a school principal. And uh, one thing that really helped the transition from Florida to Indiana is we had a very mild winter my first year. But I can still remember seeing ice frozen in the gutters. And of course, from Florida, if you saw ice in the morning, it was melted by noon. Didn't happen in Indiana. <laughs> but we had our first snowfall was in March. And it happened to be on the day of the week 
that I didn't have to be out in the field on the freshman surveying course. So <laughs> I felt very, very fortunate. <laughs> and the first time I remember we had snow flurries show up, everybody was hollering at me to come look at the snow. <laughs> and I always tell the people that I, being from Florida, I thought snow was something you had on television when you had bad reception. <laughs> um, what do you um, what do you remember most about being a student at Purdue? I mean, do you have any memories that really stand out? Uh, a couple. Of, one of the uh, it was a tough school. You had to study, or you just wouldn't be there. Now, and our, our physics class, and we were in special section in physics that required, with all the engineering science students that required calculus before you took the core. And the second semester we had a young graduate student teach us and he asked if we would be interested in learning something about modern physics, which, in the, which is a euphemism for nuclear physics. And we said yes, so we all volunteered for a class on Saturday morning, no credit, we went to class with him for about an hour and a half every Saturday morning. That's dedication. And uh, he would give us an assignment. Uh, each one of us would get an assignment, and we had to research that subject and make a presentation to the rest of the class the next week. So uh, it, it wasn't exactly uh, you know, a free ride. No, but that, that sounds like a graduate course. <laughs> that was one of the things. And, and the most, the one course I really liked was taught, taught by uh, Professor Bogdanov, which we used to call the Mad Russian, and it was bas called basic mechanics, and anything that's basic is not really basic, but anyway. And I will always remember the, one of the questions that was on the final exam. The, we had to write the equation of the motion for an ant that was crawling along an axis of a certain diameter wheel on the equator of the earth relative to the sun and then we had to differentiate it so you could get the speed and the, and the acceleration and you had to have it all right or you weren't going to get any you were going to get zip credit but I remember that very very distinctly wow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I guess the, uh, it was it was interesting that uh, the four of us that went to class together it was a Bill Reinecke, who graduated number one in our class, not, not an aero engineer, we're number one at Purdue. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Bill was smart as a whip, uh, nicer guy you could have never asked for, okay? Another was Chuck Babcock. Chuck ended up being a professor at Caltech. Bill ended up as the chief engineer for Textron Corporation. The other was Carolyn Kinsler, and I don't know what happened to Carolyn, okay? And myself. I, I consider I was probably the, the worst student in the class, but uh, we used to swap around on some of the things. Somebody, Bill was always first. Bill Reinke was always number one. He always scored better than anybody else. There's the other three of us who would jump around who was like a third or fourth. But uh, that, the, the, the fact that we were there for four years, was, was, it was really a, a great experience, okay? Uh, Hopefully you had time to have some fun. I don't know, it sounds like with your course load. Well, you, you just had to, you, you, typical, you know, we typically study till two o'clock in the morning, okay? Yeah. And I can remember when we do mechanics class that uh, Chuck Babcock and, and myself and, and uh, Bill would all get down at one of the local eateries down on University Boulevard, it was open until three in the morning, and we'd sit there and we would get something to eat and spread our books out on the table and start with trying to work on problems. <laughs> <laughs> Food always helps. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but that, that, that's, uh, you know, it was, it was a very good experience. I think uh, it helped me a lot grow because I was, a, I was a first child, okay? There were no kids in my neighborhood when I was my age when I grew up. So mm -hmm. I, and, and, uh, I, th I was probably a somewhat socially awkward or backward, okay. but uh, it all turned out for the, for the better. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, that's uh, you know a part of that's a retrospect on my part. <laughs> right. Uh, and uh, but uh, it, it was a good experience. It's a great school. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think? Can you pinpoint something at Purdue that you think really helped you prepare for your career? I mean, is there some 
What were the most important lessons that maybe you graduated with? Stick to it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's probably it, okay? Yeah. Pro you just have to per persevere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, there's some some courses you you know you won't do as well in as others, okay? And you just have to stick with it. And I guess that's probably it. that and the fact that you know you don't get anything for for nothing. Okay? Right. You have to really work at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I want to switch to asking you some questions about your first. Uh, your first professional jobs okay. and um, could you tell us a little bit about how tell us how you came to work um, at IBM and be involved in the US space program okay well I, I originally was worked at Cape Kennedy for General Dynamics on the Atlas program uh, I was one of uh, three engineers that was assigned to a mechanical lab we had a office space up in a hang one of the hangar buildings at Cape and we were responsible for all the ground support equipment on four Atlas launch sites. And uh, I had to, we had to cover two shifts. So every, pardon me, every third week you were on second shift, uh, which is pretty fairly typical of everything at, at the Cape because it was pretty much a very intense environment. And what year was this? Was in the this was, uh, early. must have been about 1961. So right when we're, we're moving forward, we've yeah. got to meet that deadline. And then uh, I transferred from there out to the launch pad 36, which is an Atlas Centaur pad. Uh, I had a, a, a fairly unique job there, and most, most of the engineers there were involved with checking out missiles, and I was mostly involved in assembling them, put them putting them together, okay? The Atlas Centaur was a two-stage vehicle. The second stage was was hydrogen fueled, which meant you had to have a lot of uh, insulation on the vehicle to keep the hydrogen from boiling off. And so the the insulation panels that went on it for uh, it took a lot of work to put those on. And we worked on second and third shift because. I had the mechanical part of the job, another engineer had the electrical part because all these, to get rid of the panels after you got out of the atmosphere because you didn't want all that extra weight, you had, you had to cut them off of the vehicle and it was all done with uh, electrically shaped charges and this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that uh, you got rid of all that, that sort of thing. Another unique part of that was that I also got to see the spacecraft, the surveyor spacecraft itself. It was developed by Hughes Aircraft, as I recall, and it was up in one, another hangar building in a clean room environment. So I went up there with my technicians, and we'd have to all go through the air shower, get dressed in what we call monkey suits, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we actually had to put the spacecraft onto an adapter, and uh, the uh, you clamp it down and there were three springs that held it together and the springs had to be fairly precisely calibrated because when you got into space there would uh, an explosive boat would pull a pin out and, and let the springs free and it would push the spacecraft out into space and it was critical that you, the tumble rate was fairly low okay uh, as I recall it could tolerate about I'm just pulling these numbers out from memory, about 10 r r tumbles revolutions per minute. And as I recall, we were down about two and a half revolutions a minute. So we were well within the limits of, of being able to, no one else on the launch pad ever got to see, see the spacecraft. So we brought it out on a special trailer, all air conditioned and this sort of stuff. And we hiked it up and installed it on the vehicle. So that part of the job was, I think, was really, really rewarding. And mm -hmm. I also had, uh, responsible for all environmental control stuff that the air conditioning and this sort of thing for the vehicle also mm -hmm. and I can remember one time on a countdown uh, we'd have to switch the air conditioning system from air over to nitrogen so, so you didn't have any moisture in it so the things wouldn't freeze and the valve didn't open hmm. so two technicians and myself and a, and a pad safety officer had to open the door to the blockhouse. We walked down to the launch pad. It's 
eerily quiet. There's nobody there. Everybody's, it's not the, safe the, to the be there. The red lights are flashing, right? okay? <laughs> and the Atlas has had a, what they call a boil off valve because you was loading the, loading fuels up in that first stage and it would boil off and it had like a vent valve and go whoosh, like that periodically. And we went down there and opened up the, opened up the cabinet, wrapped the valve and it opened up like it was supposed to and we closed it back up and went back up to the blockhouse. <laughs> Just give but, it a kick. But it was a very eerie feeling. Oh, I can imagine. And then uh, I had a counterpart, a design counterpart in San Diego, uh, and I learned through some contact with him that IBM was looking for people at the Cape. Uh, IBM would not normally publish any information about job openings because they were to, did not want to offend customers. And so I called up IBM and said yes they were hiring engineers so I took my uh, resume down they called me up a few days later and I went in for an interview and I, I remember uh, I finished the interview and I was just about to walk out and the interviewer asked me about working overtime and I had worked a good bit of overtime at General Dynamics I, at one one stage I worked back to back 80 hour work weeks and did not work on Sunday and I said well I wasn't really happy about the overtime but I would do my share so they hired me and the third week I was engineer in charge on second shift and I worked all night long that first night <laughs> and you were pretty young I mean you were right? well, I you was, was just 32 oh, 30, in your 30s yeah and uh, then uh, I was very fortunate to uh, to uh, be nominated by my manager for an award, okay, which, and I was IBM's first recipient of the Man Flight Awareness Award, which uh, resulted in uh, a trip for my wife and myself to Houston, Texas. Uh, we got to view one of the launches in the VIP stands. Mm -hmm. Okay, we had our picture taken with uh, fellow Purdue astronauts Gus Grissom and Roger Chaffee, who was a classmate of mine, and. Uh, that the capsule with that information on it was taken to the moon by Neil Armstrong. I was a, by that time I was a mechanical systems manager for IBM uh, and I was in the firing room when Neil Armstrong was launched to the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, the inter interesting part of the operation is two weeks before launch we went on a 24-7 day schedule. So, uh, and the chief engineer required that a manager from each project had to be on site 24 hours a day, which meant there was myself, my electrical engineering manager counterpart, and our boss. Okay, one of the three of us had to be on site at every, every moment. We were all obviously there when the launch went on, but uh, I t took my crew and di divvied it up uh, and made it what I, what I would consider very difficult for both of them, okay? Since we had to be there for 24 hours a day, we went to two 12-hour shifts. The second shift guys had to work from midnight till 4 in the morning. Not a very good time to work, but that's really tough. Mm -hmm. But the first shift guys had to be in at 3.30 in the morning. So they had to get up, everybody lived at least an hour away from the launch, launch oh. plan. So you were up at you know, two o'clock in the morning to get to work on time. And, uh, but was everyone, I mean, it, it must have been so exciting to be involved it, in that. I mean, how, it, how, what do you recall feeling? Well, it, it, it was exciting, okay, but you were working so hard that <laughs> I don't think you really had time to <laughs> sit back and look at the significance of it. Right. Okay. Uh, those were heady times, uh, and it, they were very intense. Okay, you you would launch one day, and you would erect the next vehicle the next day. The next vehicle would come on, would be launched, erected the next day. So you had, uh, you know, one night you get a good night's sleep or something like that. But and very much different than the Atlas program, that since you didn't have to refurbish the pad when you had launches in the Atlas vehicles that you. A lot of things would get damaged during launch, and you have to go back, and you may get a six-week downtime depending on what all went wrong. But here, you had different launch vehicles on different uh, 
launch towers, and you can move them around. So, and one of the one of the chief uh, things that we've done is uh, every company had a launch party after launch, and launches typically occur in you know, mid mid morning or early afternoon. Uh, launch parties were a, a thing of its own. Okay. Uh, as a manager, I always went home and changed clothes because I was likely to end up in the swimming pool. <laughs> so you worked hard and you and, all and, celebrated. And, and the guys that worked for me wanted to throw me in the swimming pool. <laughs> and the interesting thing was that the parties tend to get out of hand, okay? And most of them were at different motels and stuff that are at Cape Kennedy, okay? And uh, a company would almost never get invited back to the same motel. So you'd have to do it, if you did it at the Ramada this time, you'd have to go to the Holiday the next time, <laughs> or something like that. So it was just, a, but that's just the way it was, yeah. okay? Yeah. And uh, that, <laughs> that just continued until we got the man on the moon. Yeah, so did you work on uh, Gemini? No, I did not work just on Gemini, on I worked Apollo. on Atlas. Uh -huh. and. I did not work on the, the Mercury Atlas, okay? I didn't work on that launch pad. I worked on the one like ground support equipment on that launch pad, but not on that launch pad. Uh, and then I worked on the Saturn One, the Saturn One B, and the Saturn Five. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and uh, I, can, I can remember one time uh, I was reasonably new at IBM, and we were. The chief engineer came out and he wanted to see something and my boss told me to take him up and so we went to the elevator to take us up to the 25th floor and we were out on, we were on the launch, this is on the launch pad and uh, there, was a, there was a group of employees that worked for Chrysler Corporation, Chrysler had the first stage and they were, they were all blue collar guys and they were saying, oh, you know, guys that wore shirts and ties didn't do any work, okay? And there, there I was with a white shirt and tie on, and so was so was the chief engineer. We just sort of looked at one another and smiled and didn't say a word. <laughs> if only they knew. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, it was it was it was like I said, it's an interesting experience. And in retrospect, uh, there'll never be another thing like it. Yeah. There absolutely won't be. Now we've seen a, a photograph of you were in uh, mission control or in, uh, for the Apollo Eleven. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and uh, what, yeah. you were, what you were doing and how well, people Well, as, as the mechanical systems, we had, we were, my guys were the last ones to close up the, the vehicle. The, the instrument unit you know, that IBM had was only three feet high and it had an opening that was 24 inches square that you could get inside to, to walk around. And the, the, there's an interstage adapter below that, that from, from the, Douglas stage was below us, so the, the platform we worked on was installed by Douglas. And then when we had to empty the thing, they had to empty all pull those platforms out through our door. And then uh, we had to go close the door. One of the last things we had to do was put distilled water into, into a, a container because w once we got disconnected from the ground support equipment, there was no way to cool the electronics. Because we, we had, the instrument unit had panels on it that were called cold plates, and the electronics was very close to the machine so they could adhere to the cold plates very clo closely and you could get good heat transfer. And so we circulated a water methanol temperature through the system, which we cooled through a, a big piece of equipment we call a ground support cooling unit. Once you lift it off, you didn't have that capability, so you had a water and it went through a very porous membrane and it was uh, it would once you got into space it would change directly from uh, a solid to a gas so it didn't go through the liquid stage and that was what would cool it the heat the heat would force it to do that and it would just re-ice right over again okay and so that's the way you cool everything but there was always a competition between the launch teams to see who could close up the IU door the fastest. This was a little bit of an anxiety 
because these were all, all had nut plates on the back side of them. And if you got the threads cross-threaded in one of those, you were in big trouble because you, you have to basically get some approval to do it, use it like it is, or you had to do a repair work or to scrub the launch. Uh, all the guys that did that work were experienced technicians, so they knew to start the threads by hand before you tried to tighten them up and torque them. But uh, never had a problem. But it still, <laughs> still, still was a little bit, a little bit anxious. Mm -hmm. I can't think of any, anything else that, uh, oh, well, I was on contact from my panel with the guys out there, mm -hmm. what, what they were doing and this sort of stuff. And I, I we just, went, once we closed that up, we were basically finished, mm -hmm. okay? My job was pretty much done as far as, uh, as far as long. A lot of guys did checkout work and this sort of stuff, but, you know, they'd all, all done all that. One of the interesting things is that the launch countdown always had dead time built into it for so people could fix things huh. so you had you had time when the, when the clock wasn't mo wasn't moving at all and the interesting thing is if, if you had a problem in in the in your in the launch control center each contractor had their own test conductor and their test conductor could report it to the NASA test conductor and if you had a problem what you really hoped was that somebody else had a bigger problem so you could hide underneath their window when they were doing their work, and you, and you didn't have to call call your test conductor and tell them you still needed some more time to do it. Unfortunately, we never had that kind of a problem. Okay, <laughs> but that was it, was it was a little bit of gamesmanship going on. Oh, I'm sure. Because because every one of us had our own channels, okay, and we had our own call signals, okay. I, mine happened to be uh, C U C P. C was control, U was an I U, C P was a cooling panel. So, uh, but y you could listen in on other people's channels. So if you had a big dial, you could just turn on somebody's channel and see what's going on, okay? And if they had a problem, you know, everybody in the firing room knew about it. You were just trying to keep track of what was going on. So if you had a problem, you could get yours fixed <laughs> in, inside, <laughs> in, inside of their window while they were covering for you. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, so it must have been a very exciting time. Oh, it was. It really was. Okay. Uh, what was really exciting was when we found out. You know, once we once we got launched, we launched in the latter part of July, and on Labor Day weekend, I was in New York with my family. Oh, uh huh. We were moved. We were moving. Oh, you were moving. We were moved. We moved from Florida to New York. Oh, Talk with IBM. Talk about a shock. With IBM. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I spent. Two years, what I describe as my two years penance in New York, <laughs> and then moved to Virginia, from there back to Florida, and from there back up to Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah, so right after the Apollo 11, it was sort of, uh, yeah, you they, were talking about how the program was yeah, kind of. Yeah, like they cut it in half. It's interesting. One guy said he didn't want to transfer, he's going to get a job, so he quit. And about six weeks later, he came back hat in hand to see if he could get rehired because was nothing, nothing was available down there. In fact, at one point, FHA owned about 1,500 homes in the county. Wow. Because people just couldn't sell them. Right. You know, they, the place just got cut in half immediately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, two years, uh, my house, I, I was very lucky to sell it because I had some equity in it. Uh, I sold it for less than I paid for it. And the people that bought it two years later, it was worth three times what they paid for it. Mm. So. Mm. There was a lot of real estate change hands, mm -hmm. a lot of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was in New York. We had to. We 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 had bought a house, but wasn't quite ready yet. It was a, a resale. We lived in a motel for about a week. We I had to had to carry my daughter, who was the youngest of my two children, carry her to school. She was in kindergarten, and. Uh, and then uh, my son took the bus, mm -hmm. and then we finally got moved into our house, and we stayed there for two years. Mm -hmm. And I moved to Man Manassas, Virginia. I wanted to get back south, and I had to kind of go around my manager. I, I, didn't, I went up to, I was in East Fishkill, New York. I went up not as a manager, but as an engineer. Mm -hmm. I got 
back into manhood about a year later uh, to replace a guy. And uh, the guy I worked with was a real swell guy, but he didn't want me to go any place, and I wanted to get back south again. So I, I sort of went around him, and I got a job uh, as a transfer coordinator for some technology that was being transferred from New York to Virginia. I was a technology transfer manager. And uh, then I moved to Manassas. I worked there for uh, eight years. Mm -hmm. uh, changed divisions once down there because of the, I was in what was called the components division at that time. And our, our business was basically being transferred to Burlington, Vermont. Uh, I had a lot of vacation available at the time, so the uh, family went on a six-week vacation and when I came back, there was a lot of guys that I knew that didn't live, work there anymore. They were all in Vermont. Oh, well, Vermont's lovely, but it's very cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, I ended up going back into the Federal Systems Division, which is the division it was at Kit Kennedy. Uh -huh. And I worked there for a few years, and then I, I really wanted to get back into management. It didn't look like it was going to happen. So I, one of my ex-bosses, uh, who was in Boca Raton, called me up. Transferred down to Boca Raton. I remember he said, uh, since we were in Federal Systems Division, we only shipped about three units a year because we were building uh, computers for a U.S. Navy submarine. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, well, we'll get you back down in Commercial Division. We'll give you uh, six months or so to get your feet on the ground on commercial things. I said, fine. And six weeks later, I was managing the department. So I got back into management fairly quickly. <laughs> and. Uh, I made second level manager down there. I was a chief recruiter for, for engineering talent for about a 500 man organization down there as, as, a, as, a, as an addition to my regular job. I really enjoyed the college recruiting. I recruited at Purdue twice, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it just was a nice break, okay, mm -hmm. from, the, from the regular kind of work. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I retired, uh, and I always put that in quotes. And, 93 from IBM when they were downsizing. Mm -hmm. Oh, 1993. In 93. I retired mm -hmm. in June of 93 from IBM. I had about 29 years, almost 29 years for the company. And uh, I did taxes for H&R Block for that tax season. And I had a, got a job as a quality engineer, working for the director of quality and at Home Light. And I put in a uh, emissions testing facility for a two cycle engine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I left that and went, went to another small manufacturing organization as a, as a engineer, and from there, and that was in aerospace, and from another one in steel stamping plant as a quality manager, and then finally I ended up in a as a quality manager in a custom machine tool builder, mm -hmm. which happened to be very close to where I live, and that's the last full time job I had. And I left there in 2004 mm -hmm. when they. Recession hit and the tooling business went down the tubes and they cut cut staff and mm -hmm. my job just got eliminated mm -hmm. so no job. Mm -hmm. But time to retire. Yeah, well, <laughs> I worked part time from then on. I didn't finally quit work finally until April two thousand and nine. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I was going to ask you about you know your years. And your career, the, the, the last part of your career, and, and we've just talked about that. Um, so my last question is, is there anything that I haven't asked you about or that we haven't talked about that you think we should, or that I should have asked you? Uh, I don't think so, okay. I think we pretty well covered everything. Yeah. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, it's an honor to talk with you, and well, thank it's, you for It's sharing. nice to meet, meet you, okay, and have a chance to, to share some memories with you, okay? And, and my wife's listening in, so she, 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 she's probably hearing some stories that she hasn't heard before. <laughs> Somewhat. <laughs> well, we're very appreciative. Thank well, you very much. Uh, thank you. And we look forward to seeing you at Purdue someday soon. Well, I may get, I may get back up there. Okay. <laughs>